Okay, comrades, good evening. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Oxford Communist Corresponding Society. The topic today is who controls capitalism. We'll start with a short talk of maybe 20 to 25 minutes, which will be introduced by Ian. Um, after that, will be an opportunity for short questions that the speaker can answer in a sentence or two rather than a explanation. We'll have about an hour for discussion. And then at the end, I'll give Ian five minutes to reply to anything you'd like to reply to that's come up over the course of the, of the meeting. Um, okay, so Ian, over to you. Thanks, Ed. Um, okay, so um, the earliest humans were at the mercy of nature. So any time a harvest might be ruined or illness or injury might strike. And if something affects you in important ways and you can't control it, then naturally you're motivated to uh, understand it. Because that knowledge might help you control it, if not complete mastery. And the earliest theoretical framework for explaining the capricious forces of nature seems to be animism. So animism is the belief that all natural phenomena, such as the weather, geography, plants, trees, animals, are ultimately controlled by an autonomous living entity with human-like agency. And early humans believed that different clusters of empirical phenomena were controlled by conscious spirits with minds of their own. So we find weather gods, sea gods, sun gods, moon gods, gods of illness and healing, gods of time, and on and on and on. And these gods are the hidden actors or the ultimate cause of events, both great and small. Now, if you believe gods are invisible hands that affect your life, then it makes perfect sense to appeal to them by praying or to appease them with gifts or to communicate with them via magical practices. Keep the gods on your side. Don't anger them. Otherwise, you might suffer starvation, illness or death. So sacrificing an animal to appease a god is fundamentally desperate and delusional. But if your life might be ruined at any moment without any rhyme or reason, then you'd probably try anything. So the power and the majesty of the ancient gods is the perverted expression of the powerlessness and misery of early humans. Now, we, in contrast, enjoy a great deal more control over our lives compared to our ancestors. And this in itself removes a basis for animistic belief systems. Of course, religious and magical beliefs persist, but popular religions such as Islam or Christianity talk of one all-encompassing God who is remote and abstract and, unlike the animistic deities of old, typically doesn't interfere in everyday phenomena. So the theory of le electrostatic charge replaced Zeus's power to throw thunderbolts sometime in the 18th century we finally discovered the right words and symbols to understand the lightning deity. And once we divined its true and proper name, we could control it. Meteorologists build sensors that warn of lightning strikes and they create lightning in the laboratory. So we learn to control this divine spark. And we can multiply such examples. Many of the true and proper names of the ancient gods and demons has, one by one, been revealed by science. And so they lost their power. Instead of a menagerie of gods with special powers and domains, we have scientific fields with their own theories and technical terminology. So these gods are dead. Nonetheless, we remain subject to impersonal forces that affect our lives deeply, which we don't fully understand and we can't control. So urban environments are many layers of civilizational indirection away from nature. So the uncontrollable forces today take on more of a social rather than a natural character. I want to list a few obvious examples of that. We're subject to the whims of the labour market. Recessions regularly throw large numbers of people out of work through no fault of their own. Suddenly bills can't be paid. Families are thrown onto the street. That's happened in the US on a large scale during the 2008 mortgage crisis. Workers who can't find a stable niche in a division of labour must continue to reinvent themselves and adapt to entirely new kinds of work throughout their lifetimes. Chances are, what you spend most of your day doing was never your choice. Workers have little or no control over what their company does because it's a top-down dictatorship. 
and neither do they have a say in who becomes a manager or who leads the company. Workers must suck it up and accept every change to their working conditions. On the political level, even in formerly democratic nations, governments are only distantly controllable via an infrequently held mass vote, yet government policies affect everyone. The banks, extraordinarily rich and powerful institutions, have captured the political class. So when they drive themselves to bankruptcy, the state bails them out. Workers get treated very differently when they can't repay a student loan, a mortgage, credit card or medical bills. In fact, many workers globally live in circumstances close to debt peonage. On the geopolitical level, a handful of nation states boast powerful armies that hold the power of life and death over billions. War can break out at any time. So, overall, the micro and macrocosm of present-day capitalism is rightly seen by many people as completely out of their control. We are all subject to capricious social forces. But when we can't control, as we've seen, we formulate theories, and there's lots of modern theories to choose from. And I can't survey the range of theoretical opinion on what drives economic, social and political change in contemporary societies. But instead, I'll very briefly mention two examples, which I hope suggests a more <coughs> a general point. So if we consider neoclassical or mainstream economics, which circulates in the centres of power and is dominant in the academy, this framework contends that the capricious forces of ec economic change are the necessary outcome of allocating scarce resources among alternative ends as mediated by the market. Any uncontrollable social chaos, therefore, is the outcome of the iron laws of supply and demand, which always manifest when markets arise. So we can't blame anyone or anything if we lose our job. The demand for it simply disappeared. Just as we can't blame the law of gravity when an apple falls on our head. That is just the way it is. OK, so let's put mainstream economics to one side and to consider a different cluster of theories which are peripheral and don't circulate within centres of power but outside them. Many people intuitively <coughs> grasp that at the apex of society sit the super-rich who pursue lifestyles that most of us can't imagine. It seems natural to think that such wealthy beings must exert some control over what happens. And many left-wing people would agree with the statement that the capitalist class the rich 1% manage the economy in their favour, either privately uh, through control of um, corporations or through the control of the political process. They are in control. Some theories are even more specific. Perhaps only the dominant section of the capitalist class are in control, such as the sheikhs who manipulate oil prices. Or perhaps it's the secretive bankers who store the world's money and know all the dark secrets. Or, more mysteriously, powerful secret societies, such as the Illuminati, who conspire to steer society towards a new world order. Or it's lizards in human skin who pull the levers of power. We are their cattle, and they poison our food, water, and our air. Anyhow, uh, this cluster of theories explains social change in terms of the actions of powerful people. So we can draw a contrast between theories that try to explain why we're subject to social forces out of our control. Mainstream economics says it's a natural necessity. No one is in control. Powerful people theories say it's because other humans enjoy enormous control. So we modern people have put superstition behind us and we don't invoke hidden deities to explain what's going on. There's no animism anymore, just natural necessity, or powerful actors. So that's two kinds of answers to the question, who controls capitalism? Now I'd like to begin to consider a very different kind of answer to that question. So I haven't yet considered what it means to be in control, and this seems to be a prerequisite for trying to answer the question at all. So scientific progress sometimes consists in organising a whole range of diverse phenomena under a single principle. And the arrival of uh, cybernetics in the 20th century was just such an event. And the core idea of cybernetics is that all kinds of systems, 
mechanical, physical, biological, cognitive, social. They exhibit a particular causal structure, the negative feedback control loop. And negative feedback is the core mechanism that explains how parts of reality can control other parts in a goal-directed or teleological manner. Let's take the mundane example of a home heating system controlled by a thermostat. You set the system's goal by fiddling with the thermostat. The thermometer component of the system measures the room's temperature. The thermostat mechanically compares its goal to the measured temperature. If the measured temperature is lower than the goal, then the thermostat emits a signal to turn the heating on, otherwise it turns the heating off. And in this way, the heating system controls the temperature of the room. Now, all negative feedback control loops have four main components. One, an internal goal state. Two, a sensor that measures some property of the external world. Three, a comparator that compares a sensor reading to the goal state. And four, an effector or action system that changes the world to move closer to the goal state. And so, for instance, the temperature of our bodies is controlled by a sim similar kind of biological feedback loop. In fact, all homeostatic and goal-directed systems in nature conform to this causal template. And different examples just implement the components of the control loop in different ways. And perhaps surprisingly, there is a very significant control loop, hiding in plain sight, which affects every aspect of modern life in the most profound ways. I want to expose that control loop by starting with a basic unit of production, which is the firm. To survive, firms must make a profit. If they don't, they fail and cease trading. So the firm's goal is to maximise profits. Firms have lots of informational inputs, but one major sense datum is the quantity of goods it sells in the market. And a firm compares how much it produces with how much it sells. It may be overproducing, underproducing, or producing just the right amount compared to market demand. If demand is high relative to supply, the firm will raise its prices. If demand is low, the firm will lower prices to stimulate demand. These actions help to maintain or increase profits. A second major sense datum is the firm's profit itself, which it calculates by comparing its income to costs after the firm owners have taken their cut. If profits are good, then the firm reinvests to increase the scale of production with a view to making more profit. Or if the firm is making a loss, production is reduced. Each firm at this level of abstraction is a control system that attempts to maximise its profits by one, measuring profit and market demand, two, making simple comparisons, and three, acting to change how much it produces and what prices to charge. Now, a heating system consists of mechanical components, electrical wires, heating elements, and so on. In a sense, it has a very material and solid physical status. Control loops in social systems are just as real, but their components are more complex. The control loop of the profit maximising a firm ultimately reduces to a heterogeneous collection of material artefacts like office records, inventories, stocks of money, banking arrangements, and assorted belief systems, such as ideas about private property, legal ownership, corporate governance, and various social practices associated with being a worker, <coughs> being a manager, being an accountant, being an executive, and so on. And the social control loop is therefore implemented upon a great deal of lower level complexity. But standing behind every profit maximizing corporation, there's a more powerful and more general control loop. And I mentioned that firm owners extract profits. And the profits can be spent on luxury consumption. But if the rich spent all their profit on luxuries, they would soon have nothing left. The, the profit income must be reinvested in order to make more profit. And that's the prime directive for anyone who possesses a capital sum of money. So owners of capital, that is capitalists, can't put all their eggs in one basket. It's too risky because firms can go under, assets might depreciate. <coughs> So capitalists own a portfolio of investments with different risk profiles, such as government bonds, shares in different companies, and more speculative bets in high-growth sectors. So each individual capital 
attempts to maximise the return over its portfolio. If it fails, it will diminish and eventually cease being a capital at all. And it's right here that we find an absolute monster of a negative feedback control loop. One, the goal state of individual capital is to maximise the average return from every dollar or pound invested. Two, the sensory inputs are the different profit rates earned across the portfolio. Three, the capitalists or the financial experts they employ compare the different profit rates. And four, the feedback loop is closed by actions that withdraw capital from poorly performing investments and inject capital into high performing investments. And this control loop manifests as an insatiable and ceaseless search for high returns. The control loop doesn't care how its capital is actually used in production. It entirely abstracts from all concrete activities. The only thing it can sense, compare and use is abstract value. So the commanding heights of the global economy consists of an enormous ensemble of individual capitals, each manically scrambling for profit continually injecting and withdrawing capital to and from different industrial sectors and geographical regions. The entirety of the world's material resources, including the working time of billions of people, are repeatedly marshalled and remarshalled away from low and towards high profit activities. And in the space of months, entire industrial sectors can be raised up, relocated or, or thrown down. The biggest capitals enjoy the advantage of larger portfolios which spreads risks. So in consequence, capital tends to concentrate in few hands. So we find a large number of small capitals and a very small number of astronomically large capitals, which earn profits that dwarf the GDP of many nation states. The scale and power of some capitals is absolutely titanic. Now, all these autonomous control loops has the single goal of extracting profit from the world's activities. And if any activity fails to satisfy that goal, then the controller withdraws its capital and the activity stops. Capital is needed to make anything move, and without it, nothing will. So, to summarise, at the apex of the economy, we have a competing collection of very simple control systems that have an almost atavistic low level of intelligence, which inject and withdraw a social substance that appears to possess the power <coughs> of animation, of bringing things alive into existence. And of course, the sensing, thinking and acting cycle of an individual capital is quite unlike the sensing, thinking and acting cycle of an individual human being. However, both are self-reproducing autonomous control systems. Both pursue distinct goals and both have the power to make things happen. One control system consists of neurons, muscles and organs, while the other consists of social practices, belief systems and the exchange of a value substance. So we speak of a, capital, of a, sorry, of a capitalist possessing capital, but it's more accurate to say that capital possesses them. Capitalists are functionaries, mere human masks of an inhuman intelligence with its own logic and its own goals. So, where have we got to and what are we really talking about now? What's the best way to scientifically comprehend this social phenomenon which operates on a global scale? What we're saying is that a new kind of supra-individual control system emerged quite spontaneously from our own social intercourse and then in a very real sense has taken on a life of its own, turned around and started controlling us. And Rosa Luxemburg makes similar points in one of her essays called What is Economics? And if you don't mind, I'm going to brief, briefly quote from her. So she says, What are the black laws which, behind man's back, lead to such strange results of the economic activity of man today? 
And she continues, in the entity which embraces oceans and continents, there is no planning, no consciousness, no regulation, only the blind clash of unknown, unrestrained forces, playing a capricious game with the economic destiny of man. Of course, even today, an all-powerful ruler dominates all working men and women. Capital. But the form which this sovereignty of capital takes is not despotism, but anarchy. And it is precisely this anarchy which is responsible for the fact that the economy of human society produces results which are mysterious and unpredictable to the people involved. Its anarchy is what makes the economic life of mankind something unknown, alien, uncontrollable. The laws of which we must find in the same manner in which we analyse the phenomena of external nature. End of quote. Luxembourg's black laws are enforced by control systems that have acquired a life of their own. The laws are indeed black because they are demonic. Demonic in the literal sense that they are fierce and they're frenzied and they don't care about us. For example, every labour saving technical innovation takes the form of profit, which is then extracted by individual capitals and immediately re injected into the material world to animate new activities for further profit. That's why, despite huge advances in automation, the working day remains as long as it ever did. Every single day, millions of workers around the globe have no choice but to sacrifice their time, their vitality, to produce new profit for their demonic controllers. Let's take another example. The logic of capital demands maximum profit extraction from firms, and that means minimising wages. The servants of capital, the knights, the dukes, princes and the legions they command, are all well rewarded with an abundance of luxuries. But those without capital are reduced to mere value-creating components. Those possessed by capital live an exalted existence. But the dispossessed must feed, clothe and maintain a home with, on, based on latest statistics, an average income of about £7 a day. Take another example. Capital deals in abstract value, so things that are not owned, which cannot be bought and sold, have no value to it at all. So the material wealth of nature, the land, the oceans and the atmosphere is relentlessly plundered without any regard for the consequences. That is the logic of capital. We are definitely not in control, and something else definitely is in control. So I'll begin to uh, wind up. It seems to me that modern social science doesn't seem fully capable of capturing this state of affairs. Adam Smith's metaphor of an invisible hand hints at the truth. But modern economics tells us that the invisible hand is entirely benign. Markets, when allowed to function without interference, alchemically transform individual human greed into the best of all possible worlds. Lead is turned into gold. And economists willing to promote these ideas to the general public are well rewarded by capital. Nonetheless, it is a lie. So Marx, in his famous section in Capital on the fetishism of commodities and the secret thereof, gets closer to the truth. He points out that capitalism may think of itself as a thoroughly modern, sensible and secular enterprise, but if we look more closely, we find fetish objects with mysterious powers, magical thinking, and everything ritualistically branded with strange numbers. So mainstream economics worships capitalist competition, and Marx and Marxism has always been heretical, and like the Gnostic heresy of old, proposes that the material world is controlled by a malignant uh, demiurge, which is capital. And the whole of Marx's capital is devoted to its description. So I'd like to suggest as a discussion point that modern social science can't articulate the dark reality of capitalism because doing so requires ditching the narrative that the scientific revolution successfully abolished superstition and magical ideas and instead requires fully admitting that modern society remains in the thrall of occult forces of our own making. So back to the question, who controls capitalism? I noted that economic theory says no one, 
And theory is based on powerful people, say someone or some group of someone's control capitalism. It's either natural necessity or powerful actors. But we just sketched a third kind of answer, which is capitalism is a controller. Capitalism has its own internal logic enforced by autonomous competing negative feedback control systems, which exist through us, but independently of us. And I guess this is a, an exoteric way of speaking, but we can give the same answer in a more esoteric register by returning to the archaic framework of animism. If you remember, animism is a belief that forces are reducible to spirits with minds of their own. And a negative feedback control loop has the basic elements of cognition. It senses, it decides, and it acts. And we've seen that individual capitals are just such control loops. So, speaking esoterically, it's a spirit or a deity that controls capitalism. It can shatter itself and appear at multiple times in multiple places. It can combine with versions of itself to aggregate into bigger and more powerful incarnations. It can possess humans and control them. The spirit directs social activity by giving and withdrawing its magical substance. And we sacrifice ourselves to it, we appease it, and we hope it will favour us. So I'd like to suggest again as a discussion point that adopting a more animistic theory of modern capitalism would counterintuitively actually constitute some kind of scientific progress. So, briefly summarise, conclude. I reject the idea that nobody controls capitalism, and I reject the idea that powerful humans control capitalism. Instead, I proposed, unironically, that an occult spirit controls capitalism, and this spirit is a root cause of major social ills. And if that really is the case, then what should we do? Well, we can take a tip from our ancestors, who eventually deposed their own gods and threw them down from Olympus. First, we should adopt a form of animism in order to properly invoke the spirit and see its true form. At this point, we may hope to discover its proper name. And once discovered, we may command the spirit to do our bidding and wield its titanic power as our own. And at this point, we would be in control and we would gain the magical power to consciously direct the world's activities to meet our human needs and not the insatiable appetite of some inhuman spirit. And I'll stop. Thanks very much. Any questions? Um, I think that's it in terms of announcements. Uh, more details as, as, as we get them. Um, but, Ian, over to you then to reply to anything you'd like to reply to from the discussion. Thank you very much for all your comments. Um, it was really helpful to me. Because um, this was a, something of a trial balloon. I wanted to see what kind of reaction it would get. Because I was slightly nervous. Um, but it seems people kind of like it. So I'll take that as a thumbs up. Um, I do mean what I say. And so really, the truth of it is incredibly sad. I mean, that's the first compliment really sad story um, so you mentioned Zed um, Richard Dawkins selfish gene I hadn't thought about that actually um, and um, and that's in a way it's, it's a compliment and um, there is a, there's, there's a similarity there about you know something controlling it so it would, everyone kind of knew the, the science was there the knowledge was there but it was just Dawkins packaged it in a particularly compelling manner. And um, I think that something similar is going on, well, hopefully something similar is going on here. But as I suggested in the talk, science is about precisely capturing the phenomena in cognition such that you can act on the world in, eff in, in effective ways. And so cha even subtle changes in language or conceptual frameworks can have a, a difference. And so I think there is content there, particularly around the notion of autonomous 
negative feedback control systems are implemented in social practices that is perhaps um, um, but so it's yeah it's, it's kind of uh, a slightly new, newer thing to say and also on Dawkins and just the whole modern um, as I've got uh, older I've become more and more impatient impatient with the, the hubris of, of popular science and, and, and scientists in the media because it's all relentlessly optimistic and it and it, you know, isn't it great? And isn't science fantastic? And don't we know this? And don't we know that? And it's generally um, physical science that's portrayed in that way. And there's a massive gaping hole in social science. And um, it's just, it just annoys me. Um, I think the scientists are, um, again, playing their own character roles in this um, rather dark drama. Um, <laughs> So there's, there's hubris. There's a lot of hubris in modern ideology, including in scientific uh, um, milieus. A lot of hubris. Um, and it annoys me. Um, okay, so... What about the state? Um, well, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to define the conditions under which you could answer that question. Because I think, if you think of uh, social reality, it is highly structured and complex. There's lots of different ontological levels. And much of it, really a lot of it, can be thought of as independent mechanisms that are feedback control systems that are acting together on different timescales in massive contradictions with each other. And, um, and there is... All the, all the control mechanisms that are in play in society and then there's the empirical sequence of events and um, certainly what Marx did in, in Capital is to um, make counterfactual assumptions that some mechanisms are absent in order to try and find the true nature of other mechanisms so in most of uh, Capital the state is absent he's, he's thinking about pure capitalism and I think that's the, that's the scientific way to proceed. So to fully answer your question, what about the state? I don't have a theory of the state. Other people in the Marxist tradition have spent a lot of time and effort on developing such a thing, but I'm certainly no expert on it. But what I do find absent in, in a lot of these discussions is thinking about the different control systems, what they are trying to control, and what is their powers, and how they act when you combine them together, in particular thinking about the effect size, the effect size of different things. So one thing I didn't have the time to talk about was I wanted to try and explain how the, um, the capital control system, the, the, the entities at the apex of capitalist society, have the biggest effect size in terms of affecting all aspects of social life compared to almost anything else we could think of, and I would include the state in that. Well, the state has enormous effects, and... It's contradictory, and it is a vehicle where there can be resistance to capital. But um, I think the dominant forces in social life, um, well, the dominant force is capital and, and, and competing capitals. Um, so uh, you asked, uh, you were confused by why am I banging on about a return to animism at the end? What's all that about? And uh, the idea there is is to try and reify a social structure, to try and make a social structure, to give it a name, uh, to try and um, give a better description, a picture in our imagination of what it really truly is. So Marx's capital is entitled capital, and if um, you read it, He's not talking about a large sum of money. He's talking about a social practice that is mediated by large sums of money, but isn't reducible to large sums of money. It's a social practice that involves all kinds of property rights, all kinds of production processes. Um, he talks about you know, the circuit of capital where um, a uh, money is invested, commodities are made, and then money returns with an increment. So he talks about circuits of capital. And he doesn't talk about negative feedback control systems because that kind of terminology and that kind of way of thinking about this process wasn't, wasn't available to him. But I believe he is essentially talking about the same 
thing. But I, I think a lot of people don't don't know the aspect of Marxist thought that capital is like a living social process that has a life of its own. Um, there are more Hegelian interpretations of Marxist capital that make that a little bit more explicit. Hege Hegelian interpret uh, where we talk about the spirit of capitalism and how capital is the subject of capitalist society. It's, it is the thing with consciousness almost. Um, it's the spirit, the geist. Um, so it, 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 it's, all, it's all there. And that's why I'm talking about animism because I think in contrast to the other kind of social explanations that are out there, I think it's a step forward to reify that social structure and say it is an independent entity which is a controller. That's, that's, I think that's a truthful statement. And that's very much like the animism of old. Um, um, <clears throat> so, um, no, we won't talk about that. Um, so yes, I, this is totally rooted in mainstream classical Marxism. And I think Marx's chapter on commodity fetishism is it's incredibly interesting and it's so fruitful and generative and full of great ideas and I think it, you know, it could be elaborated even further. He was totally onto something there and he, he pointed at the hubris of um, commercial society and how we ha we're not as advanced, we haven't got as far as we think we have and we are actually quite primitive still in the way we organise ourselves and the ideas that we have. Um, Yes, uh, you asked about what's the difference between just normal economics uh, talk of it, the invisible hand being like a, a controlling structuring of society and my uh, talk of demonic entities that are controlling society. And the difference is, uh, as Ed already mentioned, is that in um, bourgeois ideology the invisible hand is, is a natural necessity, it's ahistorical, it must of necessity arise and there's just no getting away from it. It's got nothing to do with um, historical contingent social laws. It's not alterable. Whereas if you start talking about demonic entities that are controlling us, we want to get rid of them. And, um, you know, we, we, and we can get rid of them, we should get rid of them. And we also know their malevolent consequences, which I tried to draw out in the talk. Um, that's, that's the difference. Um, I did. I did state nothing ever moves without capital, and, and it's quite right to bring me up on that because it is a false, strictly false statement. And um, and um, and actually, capital only appears to have that power, that magical power of getting things to move and animating things. And that's one of the sort of fetishism of commodities that Marx is talking about, elevated to the level. Of capital, in fact, he, he does sort of repeat that language in, in volume three, where he's talking about money capital, sort of the heights of the the economy, and um, and, and of course, what's completely absent from what I talked about is what is the at the opposite pole of capital. This titanic power of capital is again just a perverted expression, a religious expression, a fetishistic expression of something else, and that something else is the power of social labour that's that's the opposite and from social labour comes all the kinds of resistance and voluntary association and fights against capital that we're all a part of um, yes I think I'll, I'll stop okay. thanks very much Ian um,